Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Megan Bethel. I'm the Wildlife Specialist with Scott Ion Alliance. And today I am excited to share um, with all of you about photofauna and how to get started with it. So first, I want to thank all of our partners um, who are working with photofauna. Uh, this is a collaboration between individuals as well as different uh, organizations across the US and Mexico border. And we've already been seeing some great data coming in from all these people. So if you're not already familiar with the basic concept of photofauna, it's a network of wildlife cameras across the Scott Island region. Um, some are owned by the partner organizations like you saw in the previous slide, but many are owned by private individuals like all of us. Um, and with this um, photofauna network, people can submit their photos on a survey and then we can compile that data and see like a whole network of cameras across the region. So here's a cool map from earlier in the spring of all the camera points that are reporting to Photofauna so far. And since the screenshot, there's been a whole bunch more, just really exciting. But we have some all the way up in the uh, Mogollon Rim and then some down in coastal Mexico. We encourage cameras from all over the place. It doesn't have to be within the Sky Island region, um, so long as you get the species on the checklist. So first, I'm just going to do a brief overview of why we like wildlife cameras. Um, first of all, they are great tools of monitoring the animals that live around us, and they limit the stress on the animals. Because we're not out there physically tracking them down, putting collars, or observing their behavior, it puts a lot less stress on those individuals um, because humans aren't just following them around. And additionally, uh, that saves a lot of people's time. Um, it's but it takes a lot of time to be out in the field, following these animals, tracking them, doing all the telemetry work. And it's a lot cheaper uh, buying one camera at a couple hours of time to go volunteer and check these cameras as opposed to paying someone months to go do field work. So it's pro for both animals and people. And also these cameras are great because they allow us to observe behavior um, that normally people wouldn't be able to see if they're out there observing these animals. So like, for example, feeding, hunting and stalking of prey and additionally nursing. And we get to see animals that are on, less common on the landscape, so, such as little bears. Uh, you don't see baby bears as much. Um, and then the most useful tool of these wildlife cameras is that it allows us to track trends across the landscape as animals move across um, borders and different between mountain ranges, but also allows us to track trends throughout time. So if a camera has been out for long enough, say a few months or a few years, you can compare seasonal differences or perhaps um, the effects of drought like we had or the large rains we also had. Um, so this is a great tool of monitoring the animals that are out here without being too invasive about it. So just a quick overview about um, how wildlife cameras work. They seem pretty complicated and they are, but the basic principles is that these cameras work on a combination of heat sensors and motion sensors. Um, these cameras are equipped with an infrared sensor. And so when a warm-blooded or like a hot-bodied animal walks past that little cone of like the sensor cone, it'll trigger the camera to take a photo. And additionally, it also looks for motion. Um, and so some things to keep in mind is that these cameras were developed for hunting primarily. And so they're optimized for finding large bodied mammals because they're warm blooded and they're a bit bigger so they can capture that motion. Um, so these cameras might miss smaller mammals and it might miss lizards, which are other reptiles because they're not hot blooded, they're at the same temperature as the landscape, which is really interesting. Um, and then also what, something that the camera manufacturers didn't quite think of is that in the desert Southwest, when it gets really hot, the grass and starts waving around in the wind and triggers the camera because it's hot and it's moving. So it is really common to see lots of blank photos, but hopefully within those blanks, there are some animals, which are often are. And then the biggest part of operating a camera is going out there and checking it and placing it. So this is me uh, last spring, and we had to get creative because there was no trees or fence posts to mount the camera on, so we use this old Zatal stock. Um, basically, when you want to place a camera, you look for the most upright thing you, you can. It can be your fence post, or leg of a stool, uh, or a tall stock. 
And then the big thing is going out there every few months, in the case of Photofauna, every month, checking your camera and swapping the SD cards because that contains the data, just like any other camera. And so for Photofauna, we are looking at a selection of species that we want to know the presence or absence of in this region. Uh, we can't have them all, or else we'd have a list that's over 500 species long, I'm sure. So we've kind of divided them up into several common categories that have animals that we want to know if they're present or absent on the, on the landscape. So first we have migratory species that are not in this region all the time, but we want to know when they're starting to show up in the Sky Island region, when they're leaving. So this includes a lot of the birds as well as the bat, the lesser long-nosed bat, which I'm sure a lot of people, if you have hummingbird feeders, are currently getting. I sure am. Um, and then the second and the biggest category that we're interested in is the urban adapted species. These are animals that are uh, most commonly thought to be adapting well to the urban landscape and being around humans. And this is a um, field that I'm really interested, personally interested in, seeing where these animals are showing up across, like in central Tucson, as opposed to rural, rural Mexico. And then, um, so this contains a lot of our common species like the bobcat, coyote, but as well as our uh, smaller mammals like the squirrels and those cottontails, and then some of the birds. Additionally, we also have endemic species. So that means there are species that are native only to this region, and the Sonoran Desert region, the Sky Island region. They're not really found outside of it. Um, and these are important to keep an eye on because they're not threatened or endangered, but they are unique to this landscape. And we wanna make sure that they're still being found as urbanization gets uh, more common, different climate, climate changes. So we have like the Gila monster, jackrabbits, the gold's turkey, and the Arizona gray squirrel. And then on the opposite ends, we have the wide ranging species. These are animals that are large bodied and they need a lot of space to roam for mates, for food, and just to live their life. So this includes a lot of large ungulates like deer and pronghorn, um, but also the large predators like the black bear, mountain lion. And if we get them, the ocelot and jaguar. And also we have the subtropical species. And these are animals that are found in South America and Central America, but their ranges are just ending right, um, like we're at the very Northern end of their range. And um, it's good to keep an eye on them as the climate changes, we wanna know, are they increasing further North or what's going on with them? So that includes like the coati, the javelina, the opossum, which is um, the Mexican subspecies. And it's not the same one that's found on the East Coast. It's a whole different subspecies that comes up into the, into the Arizona and Sonora, which is really cool. And then two species of skunks. And then opposite of the urban adapted species, we have the species that are sensitive to development. Um, these are ones that are typically thought of as not being around uh, urban, urban areas, and it, it's really interesting to see if they do show up in these more developed landscapes, so like badger, beaver, ringtail, and then some of the more secretive species like the spotted skunk and the porcupine. So um, these are a little less common, but if they do show up in a place we don't really think about, it, that's something to keep an eye on and we'll let, let developers and local landowners know that these uncommon species are here. And then lastly, we have uh, kind of a miscellaneous category. Earlier this spring, we added a whole lot more mammals to our list because these cameras are designed for mammals. So we, like, we added a whole lot more just to see if they're around or not. So I kind of call this category the desert and mountain species. They're not typically found in the Sky Island region, um, but there will be cool to know if they are around. So there's the kit fox, which is a more desert, like actual desert fox, and it's not as common in this region. And then the weasel, Abert squirrel and elk are more alpine and mountainous species. And they're usually found a little bit farther north in Arizona, but it'd be really cool if we got them in the Sky Island region. So that's why they're on the list. So with this whole list of species, um, we can determine presence and absence using this data based on what, what people submit. So each month uh, for Photofauna, you submit a survey and then a single photograph documenting the presence or absence of that species. So if you have a coyote in your camera, you'll submit a picture of it. 
it's basically a voucher of, yes, you have a coyote. Um, so here, this is the map I took a screenshot of, excuse me, earlier this week. And all these little dots are surveys that have confirmed a coyote sighting. And you can see it's a whole kind of range. The big clump in the middle is the sky on region. And then we have a survey in California, which is pretty cool, and a survey further off near Chihuahua. Um, but that shows kind of, they're all across the Skyland region. And this is where we have cameras. I'm sure there are coyotes in between these gaps. So hopefully if you live in these gaps, you can start contributing to fill in those areas. But compared to like a gray fox, they're only present 27% of the time on these surveys. And it's a bit different distribution. They're still pretty common, um, but compared to the 61%, they're definitely not as common as our urban adapted coyotes. But compared to like the mountain lion, a much more secretive and elusive big cat, they're only present on 9% of the surveys. However, I thought it was interesting that they are pretty widely found in, in our kind of distribution map. There's less surveys reporting them, but they are still all around, which is really neat. And then of course the javelina is present 50% of the time on these surveys. And you can see right around Tucson, there's a whole bunch of surveys reporting them. Um, so I think that kind of lends credence to their urban adaptedness and they're doing pretty okay. Roadrunner, we have a few birds on our list. They're big enough to be seen and identified um, confidence. So you can see the roadrunner is present 22% of the time. Um, they're more of a desert bird. So if you have a camera higher up in the mountains, you might not see it. But compared to a gold turkey, they're only present 2% of the time. And compared to that distribution, they're far less common on the landscape. And that's something that's really neat to see. It's like you have a large selection in the oak woodlands near the border and a few more in the higher elevations just north of Tucson and then in Sonora. Um, but say like if someone did get a turkey in central Tucson, that would be something to note. Um, that could be leading to protecting that species further. So a lot of these maps and surveys lead to more questions, but that's why we want to do this and see where we can be protecting these species and where these animals are on the landscape. So that's kind of it for my overview. Next, I'm going to be kind of walking you through the main parts of the photofauna website, as well as our checklist. Um, and all this information I'm going to be talking about is on our photofauna website. It's on uh, skyandalliance.org. And under our projects, we have a um, nice web page. Hopefully, Anna can post a link to that in the chat. But on this web page, we have um, a getting started guide, which will walk you through how to put up a camera and how to do your survey submissions, a species image gallery, just in case you need a reference picture of what each of those species listed earlier looks like. You have a really robust FAQ section. So if you have a question, um, check there first. Otherwise, you're welcome to contact us. We can help you. And then lastly, we have a species ID resource, which has some field guides um, about how to identify animals on camera <clears throat> and some other useful tools. And then most importantly, this is where the check or the checklist uh, link is. So when you do have a full month's worth of data, you come to this website and click the link. Oops, and I forgot <laughs> my order of my, my presentation. So first, before you even submit your survey on the website, you got to set up a camera. Um, so hopefully, you, if you're interested in this, you have acquired a wildlife camera. It doesn't have to be a wildlife camera. We have success with security cameras like Nest or different other motion triggered um, security cameras. But the big thing is to place it on your own property or to get permission from the landowner. Um, we, please do not trespass. And um, if you want to put it on public land, you need a permit, which is often lengthy um, to get. And you need like a special, usually a scientific purpose. So it's just easiest to set up on your own property. Um, if you don't think you have animals on your on your front lawn, you might be surprised. I live in central Tucson and I thought, oh, we only get squirrels and doves, but I've gotten coyotes, have lemon, and a whole bunch of other really cool species. So you'll be surprised what's out there. <clears throat> And secondly, you want to make sure you place the cameras where you think animals are. Um, that'll help increase your odds of getting something. 
So look for trails, um, tracks. If you've seen the physical animals, like say you know they have one to come into that one corner of your yard, that's a great place to start. And <clears throat> excuse me, especially if you have like a water bowl or a bird bath, uh, animals come to water, and that's a great starting point to put your camera there. And we have a lot of blogs on how to put up cameras and some tip, tips and tricks on our website. Um, Anna will be putting some chat or links in the chat about that. But it's trial and error. You want to make sure you find the right angle and the right height in the spot that actually gets the animals. So, and then the second part is checking, um, checking and collecting those photo data. So for photo fauna, we want people to check their cameras once a month. If you are in a remote, remote area, it can go every couple months. But for each survey, it's one month of time. And when you go out there, you swap the memory card, or you can bring a computer out and do it there in the field. And that's basically make sure that, that the camera is running 24 seven. And then you wanna make sure you check the batteries. You don't want your camera to die on you and lose all that data. Um, and the next step is you bring that data home, you plug it into your computer and you go through the photos. And this can be boring, but also I find it really exciting because it's like the lottery. You never know what's gonna be in there. Um, and it makes sure you keep track of what species occur on your cameras and what species you're actually looking for on the checklist. So a lot of wildlife camera checking is photo management. I say I'm like a librarian. And here's an example of a photo fauna camera that I check and personally submit for, and it's been out for a lot of years. And here's a screenshot of all my little month folders. And I write submitted when I have submitted that survey. That way I keep myself organized or else I'll go crazy. And everyone will have their own way of managing and sorting their pictures and make sure, making sure they don't get confused. But two, cat, two ways I do it is I either make a folder for photo fauna submissions and I put the best photo I like in there of each species, or I just rename the picture um, of what animal I want. But I recommend find the, the way that works best for you and you can keep consistent on. And then the next step, that's when you go to the website and click on the photo fauna submission page. And for photo fauna, the big thing is we want one survey per month per camera. If you have multiple months of data, you can submit one survey per month. So if you had a camera out from July to October, you'll submit a separate survey for each of those months. And then if you have multiple cameras, you do multiple surveys for that camera. We do check and we'll ask you to redo it if that isn't the case. And the big things we want to know is the submitter's information, that's your contact information, and that's kept private. That's only if we have an issue with the survey or the photos, we'll contact you um, and ask for an uh, update or a fix. Also, we want to know the camera information. And these are the two most important questions, in my opinion. It's the month you're submitting for. So it'll be a drop down of the month. So say you're submitting for July or October, you put that in. And also the location of the camera. This will help us know where you are um, and also help kind of distinguish each survey. And this location is kept private from the public. This is um, for our own reference and anytime it is shared on the map, it's obscured within like I think five kilometers. So uh, you know, don't worry about that. And one little tip um, that will save you a lot of time and in confusion is to save your coordinates of your lo camera location and then you can just copy them and paste them in each time uh, into this little search bar in the map view. So if I go back to this other slide, you can see I have this little text file with the coordinates of this camera. And that way, I don't have to search around with this little blue cursor each time. And that's has saved me a lot of trouble. I recommend it for everyone else. Um, and so then the next part of the survey is the checklist and the photo submission. I'll show that in the next slide. And that's the big chunk of the survey, but um, it shouldn't take too long. And then there's a section for additional photos. So say you have more species that aren't in the list you want to submit, or you have like a really cool photo of like a behavior or something neat that's happening. And then lastly, we ask for a photo permission. Um, you can say yes, you want you, you don't mind us share using these photos for communications, or you can say no, do not use these for communications and respect that. So here's an example of the species checklist. Um, it looks intimidating, but it goes by really quickly, especially if you know what animals are on your camera. So they're divided up into 
kind of taxa categories based on the type of animal. So we have one for the canines, the fox and coyotes, uh, cats, skunks, and keep going on. And then um, we have a section at the bottom for birds and reptiles. But say you check your camera and you have your list of species, you'll go through and open the drop downs and pick um, in the animal that you have. So say I have a black bear photo, put a black bear, and then all the questions are defaulted to no, just to make things quick and easy. But if you do have it, you want to click yes, and then it will ask you to upload a picture. And that's when you do it. Um, it's super easy. You just go down the list um, based on the animals you have. And that usually takes me about five minutes. And then at the bottom, there's a question for any additional birds. And there's also a question for additional reptiles. We can't list every single bird or every single reptile on this list, it would be nice, but it would make it 10 pages long. And these cameras aren't uh, that are like made for detecting birds and reptiles. So if you do have a really cool bird or a snake or a lizard come on, there's a spot where you can say yes, and you can upload as many pictures as you want. Um, and that way you can submit and show that they are there. And one little thing, this is just a reminder, is that don't let your cameras die. It's, these cameras can go about six months on a single uh, set of batteries, but if you're not careful and you let the batteries die, you lose data. And I've had that happen several times, and what if that one month the Jaguar walked by and your camera was dead? We never know. Um, we use uh, lithium batteries, and based on this little graph, they have the longest um, use time, but for all batteries, they have a pretty steep fall off of when they actually do die. So when, you, when your camera says your batteries are low, respect that and change them out. <laughs> okay. So that was basically it for photofauna. I really recommend checking our website for the full information. Um, but I just kind of want to go now over the cameras. I personally check for photofauna and the right, like how they're set up, what they look like, and kind of the animals that they're getting, just to show you a variety of things. So the two top the ones on the top are on um, Forest Service land and they're under the Sky Island permit. But this one at the bottom is, just on, is on private property. I have a couple on my own house and then a few other ones, a few on a, another private property. So. so here's an example of that mountain camera. It's in the Patagonia Mountains. And if you live in a more rural spot or if you have a friend or a family who has a ranch or some more um, more rural landscape, I really recommend reaching out and putting a camera there because there's some great animals. So like here we get kawadi and possum and puma. And I've always liked checking this camera. However, I also have several cameras in central Tucson and one's in a little historic outdoor theater. And then the other ones are just in my parents' front yard and I still get really cool animals. So we get some of the more classically urban animals like the raccoons, taking a bath, we have this nice coyote, they're always around, and then javelina. But here is a bird that isn't on our checklist, but I submitted it in the additional category, the Harris hawk. Um, and uh, a lot of the raptors are becoming more and more adapted to urban environments, so that's kind of neat to keep track of as well. However, I just think um, these animals caught me by surprise. These are from my parents' camera in their front yard, and this is a striped skunk and a ringtail. And these are both animals I would never expect in central Tucson. Um, Springtails are very elusive and they're usually found in the remote Rocky Canyons or in the rural towns. And then I've just never seen a skunk in Tucson. Um, I think the roads are really rough on them and they can't quite get across. So uh, seeing these animals in, in my neighborhood was really cool to see and I would never have known that they were here without photofauna. So that's why I really encourage, even if you don't think you have cool animals around, it's worth placing the camera because you never know. And then lastly, another little fun game I like to play with myself is trying to go for skunk bingo. Um, if you're lucky to live in an area that has all four of our native skunk species, um, try to get, try to see if you can have all four species in one month. This only happens on that one camera that's out in the mountains. It's not where I live. Um, but if you're a little bit higher elevation, you probably can get all four. So we have the striped skunk, we have a little spotted skunk, which is super cute. 
We have the hooded skunk, which is probably the most common skunk you'll see on these cameras. They have a big long tail and kind of variable color patterns. And then of course the hognose skunk, which has their big kind of bare nose and their powerful claws. But I've only gotten skunk bingo like three or four times on this camera over several years. So <laughs> there's no prize except for skunk pride, I guess. Um, so that's all I have for photo fauna. I'd love for you guys to also join us next week where we'll be talking about the first year of results from photo fauna. And it's next week at the same time from 9.30 to 10. And there's a uh, link, um, Zoom link on our website. And it should be really cool. We have a lot of nice maps and results. Um, I'm excited to see it as well. So thank you so much everyone for joining. Um, I'm happy to take questions uh, either now, but if you have questions later, or if you need help identifying species, I always love helping looking at animals and trying to figure out what they are. So you're welcome to contact me at Megan at So I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you. Okay, Megan, so we have a question from Sarah. What kind of batteries do you recommend or does anyone plug in their camera somehow to permanent power? Um, we recommend lithium batteries, but I have personally used just the regular um, alkaline AA and they work fine. You just wanna make sure you keep track of when they actually are starting to taper off. Um, I do know a lot of cameras have the option for being solar powered. Uh, I believe my supervisor, Emily Burns, she's trying out some of those solar panel cameras, but I, we're not quite sure about the reliability. Um, but if you have a nice sunny spot, that's something that's worth a, that's worth a shot because That'd be great if you don't have to keep using batteries. And for the lithium batteries, how long do those typically last? Um, I think the range is like six months, but we change them out every three to four just to be safe because we fear the whole data loss. You don't want to avoid that. So, Awesome. For beginners, do you have any tips for going through, you know, let's say a camera gets a thousand photos. Like, do you have any tips for how to go through those quickly and like have an eye for finding some of those critters that hide pretty well in grassy areas or are smaller? It, it, it can be overwhelming. Um, and it just takes patience. And after a time, you'll get pretty experienced at it. So the way I do it is I open it up on the full screen and then I basically just click through the photos on whatever software it is. Um, kind of quickly just to spot the movement. Um, for me, trying to see the movement and the changes of seeing an animal going across or something that's in frame is how I look at things. Also, if you have like a whole list of little thumbnails, time of day is a big thing. So say if you have like a hundred photos during the day when nothing's out, but also you see one at night, that's usually a good sign that something's there. And I looked a little bit more closely. And then once you get familiar with your camera, you'll start knowing where animals will show up and where they won't. Um, it just always takes me like about a month or two to get acclimated. So actually knowing where the scale and where things are and oh, that bush always has something hiding under it. So you'll get familiar once you practice with it. Great, thanks. Um, Brian in the chat mentions, if you use a security type camera, it could be connected to permanent power. And yes. that's a good point. Some people do use video and then they'll take a screenshot uh -huh. of, of what they're seeing on. Yeah, good point about the power. Um, those like Nest cameras can be plugged in straight into the outlet and then you don't have to worry about that. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention about the alkaline batteries is that they're really, they're better for colder environments. So say if you live in a little bit higher elevation or as we just go into winter, they're less likely to drain more quickly because they have a, I'm not quite sure how that works, but they last a bit longer in the cold. Yeah. I have a, a question from Facebook from Gerardo. He says, how are you using, uh, how are you treating used batteries or what are you doing with used batteries? In Mexico, Sonora, we have previous experiences for using, for disposing of batteries, but not always good results. Yeah, that's always the tricky thing. Um, like there's theoretically battery recycling centers. I think that's where some of them go, but we also have a huge collection of half used batteries at the office. <laughs> um, so if you have like flashlights or personal remotes, <laughs> Um, you can always recycle them that way, but it is kind of the one downside of having to use batteries like this. 
Yeah, I don't have a great solution. All right. Um, I have another question about how people should treat uh, if they find a threatened or endangered species on their camera. And then maybe we could talk generally about how we protect the location of species that people submit through our checklists. Uh, yes, um, if you do get a threatened or endangered species, you have to reach out to the um, appropriate officials, like fish or U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They need to know. Um, you can also contact, contact us, and we'll help you get in contact with them. But the big thing is, do not post that publicly before getting their permission, because um, we want to make sure we protect the animal and then the location of your camera. You don't want hundreds of people showing up uh, because you posted it on Instagram. Um, but from that end, you do have to enter your location on photo fauna, but we do not share that publicly. Um, if th the most we do is show maps, like you saw those little dots, and those are obscured within a few miles of your um, of that address. And if you're really worried about the location of your cameras, uh, you can always reach out to us and we can obscure it a bit more. Uh, I know we're all concerned about wanting to protect these animals and the greater public. So I understand the concern. Awesome. I don't see any other questions. Um, if anybody does have additional questions, go ahead and type them in the chat now. Um, but otherwise, I also want to mention, so I, so I dropped in the chat a couple of different things. One of them is a blog to how to find the right wildlife camera for you. And I think I know a lot of this can seem a little bit daunting, like you know, getting the camera set up and then figuring out how to ID wildlife and all of that. But really you just, you start with the camera and then the rest will come as you kind of test it out in different locations in your yard and learn how to check it and perfect the settings. So once you have the camera, it, it, it does become a lot easier. Um, and I think the learning curve is, is not quite as terrible as it sounds. And then I also did put in the chat a link to next week's coffee break, where we'll go over all of the, the first year results for Photofauna. And I highly recommend if you're still on the fence about joining Photofauna that you come to that because we're really excited about all this data that we've been getting. And it'll be fun to kind of go through that and show everybody exactly how you can contribute to, to science through this project. Um, yeah, and the final note too, we are launching a couple um, library kits for photofauna in Bisbee, Arizona next week. So if you live in the Bisbee, Arizona area or surrounding like even Sierra Vista, Hereford, um, Tombstone, Arizona, any of those places, and you don't want to invest in a camera, but you still want to try out photofauna, you can come to the Copper Queen Library in Bisbee and you can check out a camera kit, which will have everything that you need to do photofauna for a month. And I recommend looking into that. We're, we're just testing it out in this one location first to see how it goes, but we're hopeful if it's successful that we'll be able to, to do more kits in the future. So um, stay tuned for that. That's a, also a good way to, to become involved in this. 